Okay, so here, okay, so now if you look at, um, well, I was going to do a router thing, but I'll just wait. So back to behavior. The most important thing in any situation is to correctly assess the situation when you go into it. And this is difficult to do because many factors keep us from accurately seeing the situation that we're in. And one way I find to work on this is through driving. If you go when you're driving and you accurately try to take a picture of the road in front of you, including three, well, as close to like over 180 degree view as you can, okay? Peripheral vision to the left and right. Turn your head if you need to a little bit at a time. But you need to accurately assess the situation. So pretend like you're a camera when you're driving down the road. Like you have a dashboard cam. Don't get lazy if you have one either, okay? And take a picture left and right and front every five minutes or so. And train yourself to do that. Notice what you see. Do you see patrol cars? Do you see people in 18 wheelers? Do you see motorcycles, scooters, people towing things that are kind of rickety? Like here in Texas that they do sometimes where they chain the cars together at the bumper. Or do you see um, teenagers driving with their feet out the window? Do you see people on their cell phones? Like what do you see? Do you see a guy driving a truck with a bunch of glass beer cans in the back that could fly out and hit your car at any minute? Do you see somebody with unrestrained oil barrels? <laughs> you can tell I live in Texas. <laughs> but I mean, do you see that? Do you see guys sitting in the back of a truck without seatbelts on? What do you see? On the other side of the highway too, coming at you. Learn to take those pictures. Take them every five minutes. Make sure that you know what's around you. Is there anything at any time? One time, I'll tell you a little story. One time we were driving my ex-husband usually doesn't let me drive on road trips, even though I'm a really good driver and I love to drive. But we are both Texans and we both prefer to drive at all times, which is kind of funny. So way back then, when we still got along, we may have even been only married a few years, I think at this point, we went to visit his grandparents in Ohio in the car from Missouri. Hopefully I'm not blocking my microphone. So we went to visit his grandparents in Missouri. And... um. We were driving and it started raining, one of those Missouri rainstorms. My sisters lived in Missouri for, I don't know, since 1974. So she's 16 years older than me. And um, she was really, really fun to visit back then. And my ex-husband likes her some. So we would drive up and visit her. We lived, we were stationed at Fort Leonard White, Missouri. It's a whole other bunch of stories. We were stationed at Fort Leonard Wood, Missouri, and um, so we figured it was a good time to go visiting. So we could get home to San Antonio about 16 hours, 14 hours, so that wasn't a bad drive. So we wanted to go a little bit farther. We wanted to go see Niagara Falls, we wanted to go to Cleveland, we wanted to go to, um, where else? wanted to go, you know, through, through everything. I wanted to go see the cousins in Indianapolis, but my ex-husband did not want to do that. So we had to drive through Indianapolis, which was really frustrating. But anyway, so we drove and we we're in, um, Indiana, I think. And it started raining, like raining sheets of rain. And I was driving actually, cause he was sleeping <clears throat> and he hates driving in rain. He gets really anxious and nervous and decompensates kind of he has to pull over and stuff which is great if y'all do that that's probably safer than driving right but it was driving sheets and sheets of rain so i do that thing where i take pictures right well i was driving down the road and we were on an interstate five lane interstate each way and an 18 wheeler was in the left hand lane coming on on to us like on way traffic and we couldn't um and i couldn't avoid him and he splashed like up teen amounts of gallons of water on my windshield and it had oil in it. And so it stuck to the windshield and it covered the windshield completely from left to right. It was completely opaque. There was no vision whatsoever. And there was no way to roll down the window because the rain was one of those rainstorms where it was coming from the left. It was like 
it was like coming sideways and straight down at the same time. I'm sure y'all have been in there if you live near the Midwest. It's very common in the Midwest to have rainstorms like this. And even in Texas, sometimes they just don't last very long in Texas, but this was going on for hours. So, um, and I didn't panic because I don't never, ever panic really. I just remembered my picture and I knew that to my left, I had a shoulder that had some stuff on it. I had a bridge abutment upcoming in about 500 feet. Well, way 250 feet. It was pretty close. And I had a um, line of cars to my right. There were all sedans, not anything big. And we were driving a hatchback, like a little Hyundai hatchback at that time. And on the right-hand side, there was a line of sedans, like four doors, two door sedans, very low to the ground, not anything, no space to get it ahead of us. But in front of me, if the cars didn't move over, I had at least 300 feet of straight road to drive on. And there were no curves. We had just come out of a curve and there was a curve about 70, 700 feet in front of us, but we didn't have anything right there. So I just held steady and waited because I know that water goes down a windshield, you know, like if you or over the top of the car, we weren't going, we we're going about 50 miles an hour maybe about 45 miles an hour in the rainstorm. And so I was like, okay, I have about two and a half minutes to fix this before I have to pull over. And after the bridge, there was a bridge coming up in my lane, but on the shoulder, it would have obstructed me. So if I had moved on the shoulder, I probably would have hit the bridge moment. If I had moved to the right, I would have definitely hit a car sideways, but that's not as bad as rear-ending somebody at 45 miles an hour. So I went ahead and stayed the course and got a towel. I had a towel next to me. I just had a, we always have hand towels. I always put a hand towel on the console in my car. And I suggest y'all do the same because they're very handy. I had an actual towel, like not a paper towel. And so I was like, okay, I can roll down the window and wipe off the window if I have to, to get on the shoulder after the bridge. And the bridge will help because the bridge would cover the water, but not if I was in the shoulder, it would kill me. So I was like, okay, I think I can make it to the bridge. And then at the bridge, I can wipe off the windshield. So I was like, oh my God. And I said that out loud, right? My ex-husband was asleep. So he woke up to acres of water on the windshield and me just driving the car like nothing happened and the people next door next to us were like looking at us like you know do you need to get over but it was all really fast so he started panicking and he reached to grab the wheel and I was like stop I have this under control it's fine it's gonna be fine and it was fine we got under the bridge the windshield wipers had a second to work and I pulled over after the bridge and we wiped off the windshield with the towel. And it was black. The, the towel was black. There was oil all over our windshield. It was bad, y'all. And he said, I can't believe you did that. I can't believe you lived through that. I can't believe that we survived that because of you. We could have died. He said, if it was me, I would have swerved. I'm just going to cry. He's like, if it was me, I would have swerved on the shoulder under the shoulder and we would have hit the bridge. He's like, how did you do that? I said, I said, he said, you were driving completely blind. And I said, well, no, I wasn't because I knew what was in front of me pretty much. So that's what I'm saying. It's like, and that was just like a three second. It was like a three minute moment. Okay. It took no time at all. But the only reason I could do that was because I'm always doing that with my brain. Because I have a photographic memory too, but I all, but I take pictures with my brain every five minutes left and right when I'm driving. And I do the same thing in the classroom and I do the same thing in any unknown situation that I go into, which is so funny. So I go in and I, I just, you know, little tears of happy survival, but anyway, so I go in and, um, and that's one of the only times in my life that he's ever thanked me for anything because he's like, he said, I was sound asleep. If I, if, you, if I hadn't been sound asleep, we would have died. If I had been driving, we would have died. And he was just going to get over it. But but it's easy. It's easy. And it saved my life. Oh, 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 sorry. 
It saved my life more times than I can count. That wasn't the stalker. That was me. As far as I know, he's not in here. But it saved my life more times than I could count. Because, because I just do it. I taught myself to do it when I was learning to drive. And I do it all the time now in every situation. When I walk down the street all the time. And sometimes every three minutes or so in that situation. Because the street's a little different. But you have to just kind of ask yourself. Like, do I know what's on my left? What's on my right? What's in front of me? What the features of the landscape are? what the possibilities are for danger and you never allow your, and this is the most important thing about behavior. Okay. Especially in the classroom, but also in life, never allow yourself to focus on just one person ever. Even if they look like the scariest gang member you've ever seen, usually those are undercover cops. But if you see somebody like that, don't focus on them. Keep looking around you. You need to find an escape. You need to find not an escape, because not everybody's bad. And you should probably just ask the guy, like, what time it is or something. I mean, if he talks to you, just try to say, oh, what time it is? What time is it? I have to go. Um, nice talking to you. And don't, well, I'll give that a second. That's a whole other conversation. So you're looking around and you see somebody looks sketchy. Don't focus on that person. You walk into a classroom and you see a student that looks super difficult. Don't focus on that person. Okay. That's only one little, it's like a little tree in your landscape. Don't look at it. Don't focus on it. They're used to people doing that to them. You will immediately antagonize them. Do not do that. Okay. Everyone is equal. Everything is the same. Everyone has the potential to be good or dangerous. You don't know them yet. Don't judge them. Okay. But most importantly, don't go in and try to, um, don't go in and try to interact with the situation before you take that mental picture. So you want to know, how's the restroom? Does it look safe? Where is it? Is it over there? Where are there windows? Are they open? Can you see out of them? Can you open them? Are they like available to you? Are there any places for kids to hide that you need to kind of steer kids away from? Is the reading section a little bit too comfortable? Is there like places where people could get in trouble? Like what is going on in your room? But more importantly, like just in general, you need to take a picture. When you go into Target, you need to notice. Are the security guards paying attention? Is there anybody like, you know, trying to steal something? Are you okay going straight ahead of you? Do you need to look left or right? Are there little kids that are running that could run in front of your cart? I mean, what is going on? And that's just something I do. I, I don't do it like a paranoid person. I just do it every five minutes. Just everything I do. So that would be one of my biggest pieces of advice is do that. Take a picture when you're driving. Even if you have a dashboard camera, don't get lazy. Even if you're on cruise control, every five minutes look around you and ask yourself, what is going on? It helps you avoid highway hypnosis too. So um, take a picture. The other thing I would say is assessing the situation is, like I said, don't draw attention to any one person in the situation. Your first instinct when you're subbing, especially, is to sit down at the teacher's desk when you're doing an activity and have, or to walk around, which is also good. But you want to have kids grouped, right? But you want to group them. You don't want to let them group themselves. And you want to put one difficult kid in the mix and one good kid in the mix and the other two can be anybody don't put two difficult kids together don't put two good kids together you need them there's always two girls I had these girls but there's always two girls that are joined at the hip and Susie can't work without Sally and Sally can't work without Susie and they have to go everywhere together they just love each other so much but you just tell them you know today is not that day and that you need them, that you're deputizing them to go ahead and help you with the rest of the class. And when you sit down to do a small group, don't pull Susie and Sally over to you and sit with them all day as much as you might like to. Pull, you know, the other two. The ones that seem a little bit, I'm not going to name names because it's so, so, such a, like, fraught with danger thing to do. But go ahead and pull two kids over that seem like they need help, attention, trouble. Keep them at your left and right, whoever they are. 
you know who they are. When you walk in and you look around, you know that boy. He's got like one shoe on and his his um, one sleeve is rolled up and one sleeve isn't. And his hair's all messy and maybe he has dirt on his face. You know, that is your buddy. And he will never forget the attention that you give him. And, and oh, by the way, it's okay to tell kids to wash their faces. They have soap and water at their sinks. You can do that. It's not bad. Teach them to be clean because it's a good thing to do. But anyway, so um, in the back of their necks, too. It's really important. And they'll love you for it. They won't hate you for it. It'll be nice. Just teach them to pat their faces and not rub, and it'll be fine. So, but get those kids. Look around you. Make sure you never, okay. Yeah. So that's all I wanted to say was get your kids that are trouble close to you. Close to you. Stand next to them looking out at the world. Make them feel like you're their ally and make them feel like you would just do anything to make them have a good hour of your time. Now you'll know that they're that way if when they get their fill of attention, it might okay, a long time ago, I read this advice from Penelope Leach and she's kind of out of favor, but I raised my kids by her and I just love her. And one thing that she said was when you see a kid that needs like a toddler that needs attention, pick them up and hold them until they want to get down. It may never happen. You may be holding that kid for six hours. But if you do that once, if you pick them up and hold them until they struggle and they're like, <laughs> you know, they get they're like <laughs> or whatever, then let them down nicely. Now don't, you know, squeeze them or anything, but just hold them and pat them on the back and let them feel like you want to be around them. The same thing works for any age child, even adults. If I would do that with the stalker, I'd probably work with them. That's probably how I got in this trouble in the first place. But you you um, draw them closer to you, talk to them, make them feel like they matter to you, give them enough of your time until they say that they've had enough of your time, and then let them go. And that will always serve you. It's great advice. You will never, ever, ever forget hearing this advice. If you use it, it works every single time. Whenever I see a super nanny, I'm always like, honey, honey. The best thing to do with kids like that is put them in a hot bath with bubbles. Give them some time in the bathroom by themselves. Don't watch them because I never watch kids take a bath. My kids took baths and with me until they were like, and it, my kids were watched in the bathroom <laughs> until they were like four and five. And then they were taught to bathe and they were left alone because it's their, that's their relaxation time. You wouldn't want someone standing next to you hassling you while you're taking a bath. So when you have a difficult child like that, just start over their whole day and refresh them. Send them in the bathroom, tell them to take a shower bath, get redressed, in fresh clothes, because sometimes that's a problem and come out, start their day all over again. Just all over again. Reboot. And if you can in your classroom, you can kind of do the same thing. Have the kid go wash his face. Tell him he's got something on his face and he needs to go wash his face. And, and you know, say, I'm, I'm sure that's the problem. Just go wash it off. And I'm sure you'll act much better when you're done. And just have good expectations of them. And then just say, okay, now we're starting the day over. And, you know, I miss so-and-so. And we're going to go ahead and do this. And we're going to get this right, and you're going to have a great day. And then you're going to always tell me, tell, you're going to always know that I think that you are a good person, that you are worth having in my classroom. And tell them that to their face. So then um, give them your attention. Put them next to you. Put your arm around their shoulders, just their shoulders, half hug, you know, no body contact whatsoever. But put your arm around their shoulders. Talk to them as you take, as you face the classroom. Give them something important to do. Make them your priority. Because you know the other kids like substitutes and they can handle themselves. But that kid is your kid for the day. Now, a lot of kids don't know that they need to do that. I don't know if you know that. But a lot of kids aren't raised to like wash their hands and face before they eat food or after they eat food. They're not, they're not told to even wash their face when they wake up in the morning sometimes. You may have to tell them that often during the day they should you know they always say we're all in our places with bright shiny faces some kids aren't and you should always make sure that when you walk into a classroom that you're starting your day with kids like that and have diaper wipes in your classroom hand them out liberally to people 
and have them, you know, wipe off their necks, their faces to refresh themselves after recess. Have everybody go to the desk and like, you know, teach them these things because you may be the only person in their life that cares enough about them to even give them a second glance during the day. And it's sad, you know, but it's true. If you wanted, you could even do a toothbrush thing where every kid has a toothbrush at their desk or whatever, not as a substitute, but as a teacher. I mean, you can do that. Get Aquafresh so it's a pump thing and just, you know, do your best to teach these kids a little five-minute lessons that they will never forget their whole lives, that no one else may ever care enough about them to tell them. And I used to also have apples and oranges on my desk. And they could come up and get an apple. This is before fruit flies. I would not do that in this town. But there's a lot of towns where you can because in, in South Texas, the fruit is grown in South Texas. And so there's no truck time. That's what happens with the fruit flies. And you can, you know, there's great fruit in Nacogdoches too. It just tends to have fruit flies after a couple of days. But I used to always take a bag of apples and oranges with me when I would substitute, when I would teach. And I would put them out on the desk and the kids could come and get one and eat it at their desk and throw it away in the trash can. And then I would just take the trash bag out with me when I left for the day or um, at lunch and throw it away. So there wasn't any smell of fruit or anything. And if you can do that, then you forestall a lot of the problems that you can encounter when you're teaching, which is hunger, hygiene, um, what would you call it? Sufficient like clothing and... I don't know. There's just all kinds of things you can do for these kids that people don't think of doing that are actually very important that you do for yourself and you should do them for them too. It's like, and so, oh, what I was saying was whenever I watch Super Nanny, I'm like, honey, you need to go fill up the bathtub, get all of those kids in the bath, one after the other, and get them fresh and clean and fresh and clean clothes and, you know, vacuum their floors and, um, have them like you know Mary Poppins had a lot to do that was good she did good things and those are some things that she said do and it really works it really works to do that it has buy-in and ownership and care so the other thing I would say that's the one thing I would say first assess your situation second clean your situation if you can because people always behave more respectfully in clean environments Remember, I'm trying to forestall a stalker from coming in here and attacking me. So I have my own struggles. But every time I watch kids, anytime I watch kids, the first thing I always do is make sure that they are clean and attentive and listening. I already told you about um, walking in and asking them to do something for you. I used to have a Spanish teacher that would say, Levantese, every time that she walked into the classroom. So whatever everybody was doing, they had to stand up. And that gets their attention like this. And then they sit down again and they can work. That works for older kids. For younger kids, you just ask them to do, you just tell them what you want them to do. Kids want to behave. Explain to them the procedures that you want them to follow and they will largely follow them. The majority of your kids will no longer be a behavior problem. Remember, whenever you have a behavior problem, it's always your problem. You can make, There's lots of teachers that go home at night and they think, oh, if it just wasn't for little Johnny, my life would be so much better. No, no. It is not little Johnny. Little Johnny has problems that you would not want to have in your own life. It is you that is the problem. And that's good because that means you can fix it. So, um, so those two things are really important. Like I said before, just to review. Now, the third thing that's important, let me see what I put down. I worded this. Okay, the third thing is the name of the children. Some of these kids have never, ever heard their name said in a happy way. They've never, ever heard anybody tell them they've only heard their name in an angry way. It's always George or Stephen or whatever. It's never nice. So your job, whenever you're around any child, is to learn their name and to never use it negatively. I used to even go to the extent of saying, like, boy in the yellow shirt. <laughs> I'd be like, oh, George, you're doing such a good job reading. And then, and you know, and how do you like that book? Like, what do you think of that character? Doesn't he kind of remind you of you a little bit? And, you know, wouldn't you do the same thing if you were him or whatever? And then, like, five minutes later, I'd be like, 
boy in the yellow shirt, get off that chair, whatever. <laughs> just if it was far away, usually I walk over to them. Cause like I said, I don't yell. So don't worry. I was whispering at them, but still. Because I never, ever let anyone hear me say their name in a negative way. Now my kids, now that they're adults, they do hear me say some things, but not to their faces. I would never, ever say anything to any child in a negative way ever, 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 or a dog or a cat for that matter. But we treat our children like animals and that should stop. We have the ability to describe people in a myriad of ways. You see me struggle with it because I have to describe people and a lot of times I have to use nationalities, which a lot of people, their ears interpret as race, but nationalities and races aren't different, are different. One's a fact and one's determined by the person speaking. So I use nationalities usually, but it's a struggle and I try not to be negative about anybody. That's why I want to call my, my stalker. You might hear me say he's an ASS, a donkey. You may hear me say that he is a scum bucket, but I try not to say anything worse about him than that because he's probably mentally ill. He probably has mental illness. He was parked outside my apartment all night last night, pretty much. Probably visiting his family members that live here, but still it's very uncomfortable because I woke up to find half my videos changed. And so I wanted to call him a number of choice words, but because I knew I was going to make this video, I decided not to, I think. I don't know, you'll have to watch the other videos and find out. But those are for adults and for kids over like 15 or so. So, but anyway, the point is never ever use a kid's name in your classroom in any negative way whatsoever or allow anyone to hear you do so. Because kids have ears like lynxes and they will hear you if you're standing outside talking to another teacher about a student. They will hear you and they will know. And you can see it, you can, you know, these kids and they will come that. So the point is you want to be attractive and not repellent. I'm trying to be repellent right now in my apartment, but you want to be attractive in your apartment because I was attractive in my apartment and everyone entered in, which is not okay. But in the classroom, you want to be that snow white creature that people come to, right? But you also have to do more than just look good. You have to actually be that person for them. And even if you don't look your best, you can still be an attractive creature to your students. It's like the rules book. One of the first rules is like for a long time ago. And it's funny because they're all divorced now. So that's sad. But I, I read that book. I thought it was interesting. And what the first rule is be a creature unlike any other. And you have to do that kind of in the classroom. You have to be a different adult than those people have ever met before. And I always, I usually am. So the first thing you do is you make sure that they know your name. You write your name up on the board all the time. Remember, kids don't have long attention spans. So if you erase it, you have to rewrite it. And you might have to write it for like the first three weeks of school somewhere on your board. You, you show, show them your name tag and like where your lanyard and where, you know, put your name all over the place because these kids do not remember things and they are nervous and excited and they will forget. So then um, that's the, your name. You wouldn't let them yell at you or tell you that you're doing something wrong. You wouldn't let them um, treat you. You wouldn't want to hear them talking badly about you in the hallway or have them yelling at you across the room or whatever. So you've got to treat them that way too. And at home, if your own kids, if you can, it would be best. Remember, your job is to draw them closer. You're not a drill sergeant. Your job is to draw them closer. Now, I do ask... I would say most people would consider me to be more of an objective person. I try to deliver instruction in an efficient and um, clear way, but I also try to be that person that really cares about those kids and know, makes them know that they are special in my mind, that I will never forget meeting them, and that everything that they do matters to me. So that's what I would say to you. I hope I made that clear is draw them closer to you. You don't have to hug on everybody. Some kids hate it. I would not I would not touch every child ever, ever. In fact, most children now I wouldn't touch. But you can put your feet next to their feet. You can put your knee next to their knee and stand together and look at the world and think about things the same for five minutes. It won't hurt. And they will come to appreciate that in you. Remember, 
most behavior is about your mind and not your body because your brain controls your body. So you have to get to that first. And if you have their brains, then everything else will be okay. If you get them thinking like you, if you get them understanding your wishes for their day, if you get them to like you more, then that will change the way that you see your classroom going. It has nothing to do with touching them. I want to make that really, really clear. You don't want to touch your students in this day and age at all. But you do want to make them feel like it, that you want to be around them, that you are in their space, not in a grumpy, like aggressive way, but in kind of like a may I approach you way. And it's okay to ask, you know, that. But my point is when you go into a room and you assess the situation, don't put, don't stick on that kid. Don't um, stick on the good kids. Make sure your concentric circles are behavior colored so that you go red people closest to you, yellow people in the middle, green people farthest away, but that then you mix it up. At first, that's what you do, like the first, you know, 15 minutes of your day. But then you mix it up and start bringing those good kids closer to that kid while they're under your supervision, the closer that you are to them. So the difficult children, and this is what happens to me in my life, y'all. I do this so well that I have actually that happening in my life right now. My stalker is a difficult person. My brother is a slightly less difficult person. And they are stuck to me like glue right now because I just have that way. The red children are always right next to me. It's so funny. In fact, I've been always so drawn to these kids ever since I was little. And I'm not talking about like, you know, prison type children or institutionalized children. That's a different population than the population that I'm vocationally supposed to be serving. But I'm talking about, you know, kids that are generally considered to be difficult in their daily lives. And so when my kids were little, I used to tell the other teachers, I was like, if my kids grow up and, and marry these guys or date these guys, I'm going to have some words for you because, because I always had the red kids around me everywhere at the cafeteria uh, at recess. And my kids were always right next door to me when I was teaching. They were in the classroom next door to me usually. And they would, and so my kids knew those kids. They were best friends with those kids. And I was just like, you know, they may date and marry them. And of course, all those kids are out there right now listening to me. And they probably know, they probably turned out to be like doctors and lawyers and just absolutely wonderful people. And I'm so proud of them, all of them. But it's still really funny. That's one reason why I had to leave teaching is because the um, red kids sometimes have red parents and the red parents will sometimes be difficult then being a special ed teacher becomes more like being an abortion provider you start getting followed around a lot and that's not good then I got followed up here by some of them but in general it's a good idea so I don't know is that an, is that a good commercial or not but it's a good idea to keep those red kids around you around you all the time because they don't get that that's why they're like that and they may get all of their parents attention that they have to give them. I'm not putting down the parents necessarily at this moment, but I'm saying they may get 100% of their parents' attention at home. And that's just all the parents had to give. And they might need more than that from people. And that could be a problem for them. So if you're their actual teacher, <clears throat> if you're their actual teacher, you may want to, to make a note of that and maybe uh, have some conversations with the parents about perhaps getting some other adults to sort of give them extra attention and start teaching the kids about safe parental figures that aren't their parents that they can go to for this extra attention and make sure that you vet those people beforehand have them come into your classroom read stories with the kids have them eat lunch with this child you know pick them to have lunch with the children that need extra attention have them um, do story time with books, have them do arts and crafts with them, like do everything you can to build in. And you can do that with vocabulary, like you can make an art project with words on it. I mean, it's not that hard. And 
they can come in and help with that. My mother-in-law subbed for me because I wanted the kids to see that you could have other adults in your lives that were safe adults that they could go to for things like that if they needed to. So you just have to make sure that, um, and she's an artist. So one of the things that she did without me even asking was build in art every day to all the lessons. So, I mean, you can, you can do that in your classroom. It doesn't have to be just you. I know y'all are exhausted and put upon and that you have, but see, I had to leave teaching because of that, because my daughters became those kids that were the red kids for a while. And I had to be there for them. And um, it was just difficult. But I made that choice because no one else can parent. I could work at McDonald's at night. And I could um, I could work at McDonald's like while they're at school. And I could work at McDonald's when they're at, on the weekends, when they're you know at band camp or whatever. But I couldn't, no one else can parent them but me. Because my ex-husband is a really great parent, but he was working like 60, 70 hours a week. So that's the thing is you have to make these tough choices, you know. You can't have that cushy life and have, you can, some people can have cushy lives and great kids, but don't think everybody can because they can't. So that's the other thing I would say is keep the red kids close to you, not the other kids. Your job is to have a difficult day. Your job is not to have an easy day. And, um. What's the other thing? The other thing I would say about behavior, after you've assessed the situation and kept the red kids close to you, and don't do, but do the opposite in your in your daily life. When you go into Target, you want to be around the green people. So gravitate towards those green people. Stay away from the other people. Don't go near them because you may want to, especially if you're, you know, 18 to 25 year old person, this is very important advice for you. Don't go near those red people until you're ready to, you'll know when you're ready to, because you won't wonder if it's the right thing to do or not. And you can go in to any situation and kind of be more around the green people. Now, the funny thing is, is that the green people might think you're scary. So you have responsibility when you leave the house to look at yourself and ask yourself if you are representing a more of a green person or a red person in your daily life and why that is and what that means to you. And you have the perfect right to go out looking like whatever you want to look like every day. But it's wise to know what you're doing and to ask yourself what the effects that will be when you go among other people. Okay. So that's what I would say about that. Because I don't, I don't dislike individuality. I like tattoos and things on people. I don't think they're bad. Even face tattoos, I can see their purpose and their, their need. And, and that is an example of a child who is sort of, I mean, how would you say? Nonverbal communication always means something. So when someone, when someone does nonverbal, I see like I have contour up here, but I don't really. But when you see someone that has nonverbal communication all over them, that generally means that that person is not around green type people most of their day. Okay. They're not around people that they can relax around. Relaxation is the most important component of any learning environment. The physical body needs to be at peace. Even if it's standing up, the physical environment needs to be trusted. Like in the military, you see that people, they're not at rest. You know, they're standing up, they're at attention, but they're assured that their environment is a secure environment. Some of these kids don't live that way, and you should know that. So, like, I mean, I want you to get that mental picture in your head of people standing at attention in rows, right? That the surrounding environment is safe. So even though you consider them to be vigilant or on guard or whatever you want to say, listening attentively, paying attention, the most important part of their situation is that they can be out of a foxhole or out of their tents or whatever and not get hurt because they are in a safe situation at that moment, even if they're standing at attention in rows. You see the difference. So when you see someone that looks to you like they are not in a safe environment, 
you need to look around yourself and ask yourself, are you in a safe environment then? Because outside the classroom, like on the street or whatever, it's important. These people, they, they know what they're, the kids like that, they know the environment better than you do. And if your environment looks sketchy and the kids look sketchy, then you might be in some danger and you should probably take one of those mental pictures around you and make sure that you're not out of your head, over your head or any, having any trouble. Because I love kids like that. I've seen preachers' kids do that, right? But that's because their brain, it might be glitchy, but it's still telling them that they need to protect themselves on the outside of their body, down to the very skin level, which is a big deal, not just their clothing. And so you should pay attention to that too. You might find that some of those parents that you think are so great are not so great. And that some of those environments that you think that they go home to, they don't go home to at all. Maybe they need to be going to an aunt's house or a grandma's house after school instead of home. And you can help with that some in your roles. I know you probably don't have time to, but you should be aware that your environment may be the safest environment that person ever has, even if they're just talking to you on the street one-on-one. Okay, but the point is that there's times when you go towards green people, bring green people close to you. That is on the street. And when you're in a strange environment like a concert or anything like that, you want to look for those green people and be around those people. You might, even if you're, and I'm talking to y'all because I know YouTube is full of these kids. And I'm saying, even if you are the scariest person, like let's say that person is surrounded by five people, right? The green person, even if you are the scariest person, it's okay to stand near people that are safe. Even if you look like you're scary, you can be safe too. You have a right to be safe. So that's all I wanted to say. Was It's so funny because when I think about it from both directions. I think about it from the kid's eyes looking out at what that looks like, being a red kid in a situation. <laughs> and what happens usually is that they this red kid gets pushed to be around other red kids. This is the criminal justice system, for example, but on lesser levels as well. And it's kind of sad because the likelihood of them becoming more like those kids is greater. So you need to mix it up in your classroom. You need to give yourself a more difficult day. You need to be the person that that person can go to and say, I can stand next to a safe person and be okay. I mean, think about it. Like, Let's assume that all police officers are safe in this country. How many kids really feel like they can go stand next to one for five minutes? Not very many. It's sad. So you need to teach your kids that, it, that they have the right to go stand next to a safe person and be okay. And you need to tell them what that looks like. What do they sound like? What do they act like when they do that? Do they walk up to them? Do they give them, a, a, like, I don't know, do they give them their hand to shake? Do they take off their hats? Do they um, start with a question like, hi, you know, how are you? Or how is your day going? Do they ask, may I stand here, please, because I feel nervous? Or may I, may I be around you for five minutes? Because may I stand inside the store, please, because I feel like, you know, outside isn't safe right now? Or whatever. I mean, teach them the words to use. Take five minutes out of your day for community education and, and tell them that. Because we're raising a bunch of 18 to 25-year-olds. And this starts when they're five, y'all because they see their older brothers and sisters acting this way, they couldn't stand next to a police officer for five minutes. So who are they going to go to when they need help? I don't know. But it's scary. And I was just thinking about that the other day because I watched all these videos of people because their anxiety causes them to escalate a situation just by being in the situation. Right? And I'm talking about the kids. I'm talking about the adults. <laughs> and you see them, and they could be trained people like police officers or um, teachers or administrators or um, any kind of community leader. You see them in the public, but they don't really want to be around the public. You see them in the public, but they don't want to be that approachable person for that kid. 
they are afraid of those people. So to that kid, they're red and they don't realize it. And the kids that are green to that kid are not the kind of kids that you want your kid to be around. So you have to kind of look at it from both ways. You have to be the green person for the kid in the situations where you're supposed to be. And you have to understand that that kid might not see you that way for various reasons. Maybe you need to get the kid by themselves and talk to them. Maybe it's because somebody next to them is red and they're like attached to that person by some kind of involuntary obligation. Okay, so that's the other thing. The, the last, the one, one of the last things I want to say in this particular conversation is that you have to look at what the power dynamics are in the situation that you're entering into. You need to know who is obligated to who, who is trying to impress who, who is like best friends, former bridesmaid, um, ex-spouse of who who is the money person in the situation and it could be a kid y'all and who is um who is like the what would you call it the one that speaks for the other kids you need to know all of these things when you go into a situation and you find that out non-verbally you don't find that out by asking questions you find them they find that out by asking them to do something like I said at first because they will all listen to you. So the Levante say is a good idea like stand up or sit down or come sit next to me on the floor is a good one. Or shake hands with them. You can tell a lot from a kid's handshake. Teach your kids to shake hands confidently. And um you find that out by saying by picking a non-essential activity like um, line up or something. And you could say line up tallest. No, that's not good. Line up oldest to youngest. That's a great one. This is math. And have them line up for you before you do anything. Oldest to youngest. And then say, okay, go sit down. Or no, then say sit down on the floor. And see who they sit next to. That will tell you a lot. See who picks the best spots. See who gets pushed out to the worst spots. See who sits next to who. Look at those power dynamics. It's like shuffling on band where they all like scrambling, you know. So have them do that first. And that will be very helpful to you. Then you know what to do. And don't go in and try to be a blender, okay? Your job isn't to go in and change the power dynamics in any situation. Your job is to work within them. So gradually over time, if you're the classroom teacher, perhaps you could do something, but it's unlikely because these power dynamics don't come from school. They come from home, from the street, from, from skins and shirts, from riding bikes, from, you know, trading cards or marbles or playing late at night with each other at home. So what you're trying to do is learn how to be in the situation, which is very difficult to do for a lot of people. The other thing I would say, so those three things, assess your situation. That means knowing your power dynamics, knowing the color of the kids that you're looking at, green, yellow, or red is how I like to think about it, but you can think about it any way you want. Knowing how the kid sees the colors in the situation, right? You you may want to put the, the best behaved girl in school next to the worst behaved boy for your own needs, but that may be exactly the wrong thing to do for both of those children. You don't know. They may get married. You don't know. But you still have to kind of ask yourself. Oh, so the third thing is, Ask yourself what your motives are in the situation. Are you trying to actually be a part of the classroom and improve it in some fashion, or are you just trying to make your day easier? And the last thing would be not to ever use their names in vain. Never use their names at all in a negative situation, ever, unless it's exigently required by security or safety. You know, like if you're standing next to someone and you see someone running up behind them just to like hit them with something, then you can say, you know, their name. 
but don't just do that. Go for the situation. Use your body to respond to things more than your mouth. Kids will respond better to you if you are as active as they are in every situation. If you can be as active as they are, they will like you more. They will respond to you more. When they sit on the floor, you sit on the floor. When they stand up and have to go line up, you jump up from your desk and cross the room. If they have to go out for a fire drill, you you stand in the middle of the line and make sure that the line goes forward because I can promise you the kids at the beginning of the line aren't going to get lost, okay? So the kids will respond to you more if you do what they do. Maybe not a fire drill, but like the cafeteria. Don't stand at the head of the line. That makes you look great. But those kids know where they're going, and those girls will stop on a dime at every little you know, red square or whatever they're supposed to stop on. So you stand in the middle or even at the end and lead from the, lead from the back, which there's lots of books on as far as management goes. I mean, all these things are known things to do. And I, I don't know that it's maybe packaged them to you in this way, but I'm sure I'm not even sure they're going to be coherent or cohesive, but it is how I lead my kids. So you be as active as they are. I used to be very heavy. I used to weigh around 200 pounds, I guess, when I was teaching. I was very unhappy. They weren't very nice to me. I'll get into that later. But I did um, learn to still be a very active person. I've always been a very strong person. I play golf and I like to do sports. I play um, anything. My kids used to always have balls in the car. So like we always had a volleyball and we always had tennis rackets and golf clubs and um, frisbees and anything like that. So I've learned a long time ago that your kid, especially if they're little, like toddlers, if they run, they don't really want to run without you. So like if they want to go see a leaf that's like 30 yards away, then you have to run and see the leaf too. You can't just say, okay, well, I'll be here on the picnic blanket, you know, come back when you're ready. I mean, sometimes you can, but it's really better for everyone if you are as active as your children are. And that might mean in, as active as you, ch- as you want your children to be. You want your kids to go home from a day in your classroom, good, tired, happy, tired, not bored, tired. You don't want them to be, now that doesn't mean every day because that would be the opposite. That would make them red kind of because, you know, agitated kids are always red. So you kind of want to build in everything in your day. Like you build in science, language, arts, reading, writing, math in every lesson that you teach. There's a little bit of all of that. You want to have a little bit of relaxation, a little bit of activity, a little bit of quiet time, a lot of cleanliness, a little bit of hygiene, some handwriting, some um, communication. You want to have them writing postcards, emails, text messages. You want to teach them how to do those things in their day, every day, because that's the language that they speak. Okay. So typing, all that stuff. And you want to do that between the students, each other. So you want to have them be active. So like, for example, you never send a student anywhere by themselves unless you can help it. You always send them with another kid, not because for safety, but because it builds community in your classroom. And that if you have the time, now nobody hardly has the time to do those kinds of things, but every once in a while you might say, oh yeah, I remember her saying that that would be fun to do now. And you could do it right then. And then that'd be great. But just remember, that's the most important thing to do is to keep in mind your goals for your day. And even if you don't get to all of them, at least there'll be more in your day, your brain the next day. So I thought those things would be good things to talk to you about, because I think that's important. A lot of people don't ever think about that. But, and you may have the ethos in your life that doesn't allow you to do that. Like your kids, I mean, let's be real. Your kids may not be able to stand next to a police officer for five minutes in your family. There may be reasons for that. I don't know what those would be, but I can see that being true for you. So then you just have to ask yourself, how's that going to serve your child in 20, 30, 40 years? Is that really the way you want them to be? And if it's not, then try to change it. And if it is, then just explain to them the reasons and how to be respectful. Because being respectful matters to everybody. There's some laws that nobody breaks, right? There are some laws that nobody breaks out there in the world. Even the worst, like most horrible person in the world doesn't go down the road at 100 miles an hour every day, all day long, all the time. You know, we don't all like 
yell fire in crowded theaters. We don't say that, um, we don't sit there in, in class and light our pencils on fire all the time. It takes a while to set a pencil on fire because they're fire retardant, but you know, papers or whatever. We don't do those things. So we know that there's some rules that we follow and some rules that we break. And you can teach your kids to widen the, the circle of rules that they follow a little tiny bit without damaging your ethos as a family. And I believe in culture, family cultures. I try to respect them. As you can tell, I mean, I take a lot of seriousness about why people do what they do. I know that they have very specific needs and reasons for doing the things that they tell their kids to do. And that you have to be able to respect that as a teacher and not try to change it. Now, to a certain extent, you can make all of your kids act the same, right? Especially if they're older. I had a teacher that used to hand out rope belts to kids because she wanted them to all have the same kind of waistline and stuff. But I mean, largely the school takes care of that kind of thing now and you don't have to worry about it so much, but you can do things that, that make you feel like you are more in control of your environment. If you want to just remember to respect the child. Okay. The outside of the child, the inside of the child, don't ask a child to put their hair back in a ponytail or, um, you know, try not to convey the message that there's something the matter with them. For God's sake. I mean, you wouldn't want someone to do that to you, right? And it's so awful to see this happening over and over, especially on YouTube videos. I see all these parents saying all this horrible advice. And you may think this is horrible advice. But I, I can tell you that my kids are successful, that they have careers, that they're married to great, um, well, mostly great men. And they are great men. They weren't. My daughter's relative wasn't asked to do anything because he was able to say no. He was in a bad situation himself. I don't blame him for anything. But still, they're married to great men. They're raising kids. They're the kind of kids that you would want your kids to be, and by and large, if you like that kind of thing. And they do some bad things. You know, they have color affiliations and things, which I'm not altogether in favor of, but that's life. You know, life's a great big mixing bowl, and that's usually what happens when they get out in the middle of the world. So try to um, to take my advice and see if it works for you. Keep it in the back of your head. Assess your situations, whether you're no matter what situation you're in. Like I said, if you're on the street, do the green, yellow, red thing and stay around the green people. Teach yourself. And that might mean, like, if you're the kind of kid and you realize that a green person wouldn't want you standing next to them, you might want to think about that. The yellow people usually aren't terrible. If you can't stand next to a yellow person and for five minutes without them moving away from you, then there's some things you need to look at for yourself because the workplace is full of yellow and green people. And that's going to be something that you want later on for yourself. If you want a retirement, you want your kids to have money, you want to be able to send your kids to college if they want to go, you want to be able to do all these things. And to do all that, you have to stand next to yellow and green people. And they have to stand, to want to be drawn to you as well. And so I'm telling you this from the heart because I want you to hear me because I don't hear a lot of people saying this these days. Yes, we celebrate individuality. Yes, life isn't about splitting a 50-50 and going straight down the middle and trying to be vanilla and beige and everything that we do. Okay. It's not about that. You can be very personally creative in your life. If you want to be, you can be identified with any kind of group that you want to be, but you just have to ask yourself. If, like, if the people that you want to want to be around you want to be around you, it's really difficult to say, but that's true whether they're, they're five or eight, 12, 15, 20, 25, 30, 35, or 40, it doesn't matter. You still have to be around other people all the time. And there are things you can do. You can go to the dentist, you can go, uh, to the stylist, you can go hairstylist, you can go to Goodwill and get some different clothes, try on some different styles. You know, maybe you want to wear the kind of clothes you wear around your grandmother when you go to Target every once in a while, see how that works for you, see if it's a different experience for you. You know, maybe you want to like put the silicone patches on your face tattoos if you feel like you're going to go to the bank. I mean, I don't know. It's true. Everybody should accept everybody. Everyone should accept everyone. I never ask people to change because I like all people. 
and I'm drawn to people. That's why my kids have that way <laughs> is because I was surrounded by red people all the time because they're attracted to me and I like being around them. And so that's what my kids ended up gravitating towards, which is kind of short-sighted of me, but whatever. So um, I would say my kids are probably yellow, but that's really who they want to be. And that's okay with me too, too. All right. So you want to end for it. You want to just know, and especially when it comes to dating, dating starts in elementary school. So dating whatever sex your kid wants to date doesn't matter to me that part, but or whatever kind of person your kid wants to be doesn't matter to me either. I'm not talking about gender here, but I'm saying that um, when you look at people, ask yourself if the people you're attracted to would be attracted to you and make those changes. Now it may change, which is what happens in teenage years, which is so funny. So, you know, if your kids changes suddenly, that's probably what's happening. And in your classroom, you can kind of see it happen too. But remember dating starts in elementary school. Because there's like years from now, people will remember the kind of person that you were and they'll be like, oh yeah, she's awfully cute in elementary school. I remember her. Man, he was really handsome. I remember that time that he held the door open for me when I was going to like art class and that was so sweet of him. And I mean, these things really matter to kids when they get older. So don't hobble your kid into being what you want them to be over what they want to be for themselves. Make sure they're just as happy walking out the door as they are walking out of the school as they are going to bed at night. Your job is to try to make them comfortable in their skin, no matter what their situation is and no matter who they're around. Because you wanna be that kind of parent that lets their kids be around people for five minutes without feeling like they had to move away because they're scared or uncomfortable. And it's important for everybody to kind of hear that too. I mean, the police officers too, I guess. But everybody needs to understand that, that what happens is attraction and being repelled. You guys might be repelled by my talk. You probably aren't attracted by my talk, but that's okay because when you're a teacher, you're not really trying to attract people so much. But you might be, you don't, I don't want to repel you either. So my message is trying to tell you that, you know, I'm very accepting of everybody, but I'm kind of a sociologist at heart and I look around me and I see this happening and I see how easy it would be for them to fix. So, um, Like I was watching, there's different shows you can watch that are really interesting about this, especially on Netflix, because Netflix appeals to a wide variety of people, and you can kind of see, watch for that when you watch TV shows about who's comfortable being around who, and who your brain tells you that you would be comfortable being around and who you wouldn't, and whether that person is, like green, yellow, or red doesn't have anything to do really with appearance. It has more to do with behavior about safety and security about calmness and functionality, mostly about functionality. Green is very functional, very approachable, very cooperative, very compliant, right? But that's not all it is. It's also a feeling of safeness. Red is, means that they are more reactionary, that they are reactive to their environment, that they respond physically to things that you ask them to do. Like if you say, you know, um, how is the weather today? They knock over their chair and push a kid out of the side to go look at the window and see what the weather is. That would be a red child. doesn't mean there's anything wrong with them. It's just something that you need to know about them before you ask them what the weather is. Okay. Or, um, like if someone said, if you said to the kid, is Susie okay? they would then like push kids out of the way and pick Susie up out of the chair by her shoulders and look into her face and be like, are you okay? That's something you need to know. That would be a red child. A red child is, is like a light bulb in the classroom that's on where everyone else is kind of like at a dimmer level. Their light bulb is shining bright all of the time. And it's a good thing. And it can be very useful to you. Like if you wanted someone, someone, if you're at recess, like for me, cause I have them come to me. Right. So let's say there's one child that's like 500 feet away from me on the far end of the playground. I'd probably send a red child to go get that child because they would definitely come back with the child. 
And that's just, you know, and those are nice. That's a nice way to be. You find a way to, to, to help them be very successful in the classroom. But you also understand that 30, 40 years from now, that person might have had some interesting experiences if they don't learn how to kind of manage themselves a little bit better. So that's all I was saying is red isn't about appearances. Red could be anybody. And, and also don't judge by appearances because you may find that, and try this and target yourself if you're a teacher. Try standing next to people and see if they move away from you, like um, gang members or um, people that are way on the far end of the rainbow spectrum or, um, you know, tiny little children or whatever you feel like. Just kind of put yourself in their environment and see if they if they respond to you or if they move away. Because people physically will involuntarily step back from anything that they find dangerous to them. And so you may not be having the effect on people that you think. And it would be better for you to try to see what that is in a kind of objective environment, like the grocery store or, but not just don't, you know, don't be creepy about it. In fact, you could even say to someone afterwards, I was just trying to see because I'm a teacher and I just like to know if if I'm approachable by someone like you or if not, you know, thanks for letting me know and whatever. But just try to be good hearted about it and see what how it works out for you. So I'm sorry about this. Um, this camera is just being so weird. It's making my face look very sort of flat, but that's okay. You can get little flashes of the real me in there. So I hope that you understand my my instruction and I hope that you kind of take it within the rules of your school and your workplace and your situation in general. I hope that you'll try the whole visual picture taking every five minutes or so when you're driving to kind of like peripherally look out 180 degrees and kind of just make sure that life is is um, is as you expect it to be. Did you pay attention to the right things? Did you manage to behave in such a way that you're approachable to others? Did you make a kid feel like he shouldn't be alive today? Because that would just be a horrible thing, y'all. And a lot of people do that without realizing it. So, and also, do you even know what their names are? Like, I have a photographic memory, so I don't really worry about that part of it. But a lot of people do need to hear that too. So, I mean, just remember their names are really important to them. So you should take time to introduce yourself to each person that you come across and learn their names and try to first and last, and try to remember what they think is important about themselves, what they're proud of in their appearance, and what they aren't willing to compromise for you, which is really important too. So thanks, y'all, and I really appreciate you, and I hope that you have a great day.